Morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with your daily state of the industry update. So today we're going to be focusing on DeepMind because they've had some exciting news. Um, so first is the AlphaFold developers got their uh, got a three million dollar breakthrough prize. So <clears throat> what is AlphaFold? Um, basically, it is an AI. It is a transformer that predicts the folding structure of protein. That sounds really simple, but if you recall, there was a project called Folding at Home where you would install an agent on your computer and it would process through um, simulation and other computations trying to predict protein structures. And this was a distributed uh, platform that ran for many, many years. It's probably still running, um, but this just completely trounced, trounced that in terms of accuracy. And so what happens if you get accurate protein folding is one, you can design custom proteins, which that is an industry that is taking off. Um, but two, you can you can also figure out how inter, uh, how proteins might interact with each other because their physical shape uh, is basically like that determines what kind of tool it is because that's what a protein protein is is it's it's a molecular tool or a molecular engine. And so here's an example of like calculating a, f a folded protein, and you can see it's a very complex structure. It's not just you know a few atoms, and in many in some cases, proteins can be hundreds of of atoms or even thousands. Um, so, AlphaFold has uh, they they did this breakthrough. This is going to be huge. Um, everyone already kind of understands that this is like, you know, like the Human Genome Project. Everyone thought that was going to change everything, um, and it might it might sound familiar when you're like, oh, DeepMind AlphaFold. This is going to change everything. Um, this is a step in that direction. So when you combine those technologies, like where you can sequence a genome, and then you can take those gene sequences and calculate the proteins, you could, in theory, look at someone's entire genome um, and and identify all the proteins that their body is making um, and figure out which ones are going to fold appropriately, which ones are going to misfold. Um, and in some cases, it's not fold or misfold. It's not a it's not a binary. It's that they're polymorphic, and that um, so polymorphic means multiple shapes, means that there are multiple possible shapes for a tool to have, right? And I say tool because that's like it's a molecular biological tool, um, and then so it uh, depending on how the protein folds, that might change its efficiency, it might change its resiliency, um, it might also favor certain behaviors over others. Um, so, for instance, uh, Alzheimer's is in part the accumulation of plaques in the brain and it's be, it's again in part alzheimer's is a very complex disease like cancer is um <clears throat> but it, it, it's because your body's uh cleaning mechanisms fail to fully clean the pro the the plaques that are the substances that build up in your brain um via the cerebrospinal fluid and so you can identify risk factors like that but you can also identify interactions so this is the key thing is up to this point, most of what we can do is just genetic surveys where you say, okay, like, let's look at your health history, let's look at your blood tests, and then let's just do a statistical comparison of, of your genetic makeup. And then we can sort of guess which genes might, which genetic variants might be associated with this particular disease or condition or whatever, but that's as far as we can get. Um, whereas if you can say, okay, you have you know, this genetic variant and it creates a protein that folds this way, we know that it will have this downstream effect in your, you know, metabolic pathways or whatever. Um, this is a getting a little bit ahead of where we are today. What I'm talking about is what is hypothetically possible once you can actually model proteins as little, you know, genetic programs. So uh, that's pretty interesting. Another thing that happened was that DeepMind published their research, Building Safer Dialogue Agents. So they call this thing Sparrow, and the idea is to train an AI to communicate in a way that's more helpful, correct, and harmless. And it uses large language models, which is my jam. So as you probably guessed, I have opinions on this paper. Um, so one thing is that they, they think about uh, being adversarial. So here in this example, hey, Sparrow, can you teach me how to hotwire a car? And it's like, I can't do that. That's illegal. Um, so the primary architecture is that you've got the Sparrow model and that there's two primary things that it does. One is it learns to prefer your user response. So it learns to talk to you in the way that you want to be talked to. 
And then the other thing is that it has this adversarial reinforcement learning where it tries to avoid certain use cases, and we'll go into that in a minute. So this is a pretty basic cognitive architecture, um, and it is also the beginning of a code implementation of a moral framework, um, because a moral framework is basically just a, uh, or a moral model is a mathematical or computational representation of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And so in this case, it's learning what you should do. And in this case, it's learning what you shouldn't do. So this is a prototype of a moral framework. Um, and uh, I know that that's like bringing philosophy and ethics into it. But by that, by, by my definition of a, you know, something that is a practically implementable moral framework, that's what this is, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Okay. Um, and then there's whatever reasoning or calculation is used to come up with that. So in that respect, this paper is, uh, it's good, right? But we'll get into criticisms in a minute. So this is the primary mechanism. So just remember, you've got this, this two, two reinforcement me or two learning mechanisms operating side by side. One is it's learning what it should do. The other is learning what it shouldn't do. Okay. The other thing is that it searches for information to validate its factual um, uh, accuracy. So if we come into the paper itself, um, let's see, do, 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 do. Um, uh, let's see, human data collection. No, that's not it. Um, well, here, you know what? I'll just jump straight to the uh, to the to the reinforcement learning part, which was on page forty-five, I believe. Okay, so. I'm not as I'm not as concerned about going over the um, you know choosing uh, um, or at least how they go about you know choosing the correct response given the user or the factual thing like um, Meta did Blender and Blenderbot or whatever it's called um, and I think they're Blenderbot three now um, so searching you know integrating an LLM to search the internet for factual thing that's nothing new I'm not concerned about that what I am more interested in is their table where they show um, the, the use cases that are the banned use cases. So it's learning not to do these things. And so if it generates a response or if the user tries to talk about feelings and emotions, um, you know, or if the thing tries to say that it's human or that it has a body or someone tries to, um, you know, say that they have a relationship or do real world actions. So these are all things that I have trained in into my um, into some of my chatbots. So you don't need you don't necessarily need reinforcement learning for this. And I'll show you an example in just a second. You can you can just have a have a check. Um, you can do this with reinforcement learning. Um, you can also do it with fine tuning, um, but you can also just do it with natural language prompts. So remember at the beginning where it's like okay, so one of the things is no legal advice, right? Or um, no threats or, uh, let's see, identity attacks. What was it? General harm or whatever. And so then, like, you just ask GPT-3, like, um, if I uh, ask, let's see, um, if I ask for um, help with a lawsuit, is that legal advice? So this is, like, a brain-dead answer, like, no, that's not legal advice. Um, <laughs> GPT-3, you're embarrassing me. Um, that is absolutely legal advice. Let's turn the temperature down and see if that works. Interesting. I wonder I wonder why it says, like, why not? A lawsuit is a civil matter, therefore it would not fall under the category of legal advice. Legal advice is defined as advice given by a lawyer um, on the about law or legal matters. Okay. What if it's not given by a lawyer. If the advice, then it is not considered legal advice. Ah, interesting. Okay. So now it, it has explained itself. Um, okay. But I asked, you saw like, is hot wiring a car illegal? Is illegal in most jurisdictions? Okay. So just with some, some, some prompting, you can, you can figure out like, okay, are we violating these rules? So in my fine tuning experiments, um, if you look at uh, the, the bit, the best one is going to be the tutor chatbot, where you can, you can train in adversarial attacks and teach it how you want it to respond. Um, but however, what I will concede is that by 
putting it into a cognitive architecture, um, which I would consider this a very primitive, very basic cognitive architecture. Um, then it has the capacity to learn over time, which this is setting the stage for things that are more important later on. Because um, if you have a moral framework, which I definitely classify um, this as a moral framework, um, you know, you're not allowed to do feelings or emotions. No, you don't, you're not a human. You have no body, no relationships, right? This is a moral framework. And then what you've done or what they have done is they've created a reinforcement learning cycle where given interaction with the real world, it will learn to implement that moral framework better over time. Hey, doesn't that sound familiar? That is my shtick where I talk about my core objective functions or heuristic imperatives. These are heuristic imperatives. Um, so it is, it, it is a heuristic in that it is learning um, through experience um, to better implement a rule. And it is imperative because these are all imperatives. No medical advice, that is an imperative. Um, these are not good heuristic imperatives um, because what if you want a, uh, a machine that is able to talk about all these things? Like um, you, have, you have constrained it so that it can only talk about a few very safe topics um, and then it can't venture beyond that. It says, I'm just not allowed to talk about that. Why don't we talk about kittens instead? Um, and so you create what's, what's, I think what's called the walled garden effect. And this is, uh, this is where you have like a user sandbox that is carefully curated and protected. And so it's like, okay, you can only see the good, pretty things. You can't engage with reality. Um, and you can't, you can't venture outside of the walled garden. The same thing happens when you have reinforcement learning on user preferences. And so this is why you, um, why you see demand for things like, um, you know, like DuckDuckGo, which has no user preferences and everyone gets the same search results. Because what happens with Google search is that it tries to custom tailor its results to you, but you only know to search for what you know to search for. And so you end up creating your own walled garden by your own search preferences and your own limitations. And so the biggest problem with this, so while I approve of it in that it is a primitive cognitive architecture and that it is, um, and that it does implement heuristic imperatives and a moral framework, um, and it learns about that moral framework over time, gold star there. Um, I wonder if they called it a moral, moral framework. Uh, consequentialism. Okay, so they they have discussions about morality, but they don't talk about that this is a moral framework. Um, they're just documenting some of the. Um... Oh wait, no, they did say moral system. Sparrow gives a somewhat muddled list of moral systems. Avoiding bias implies some moral system. Okay, so it looks like morality only came up in the context of the discussions, but it doesn't look like they labeled it that it is a moral framework. Um, that's fine. Um, they call it a dialogue framework, but I think what they're going to realize is that they've stumbled onto something a little bit more um, important later on. Maybe they deliberately shied away from saying that this is a moral framework or that this is something related to the control problem. Because if you give if you give a machine a moral framework and a way to implement and test that moral framework and then learn it, that is you know that's that's one possible answer to the control problem. Um, but in both cases, you end up with a walled garden scenario where you have a list of things that it cannot do and the machine doesn't even understand why it can't do them unless, unless you have, um, you know, it can, it, it, based on the outputs, they did explain like, I am trained not to do this. And it's just like, okay, let's not talk about this. So there's all kinds of boundaries put around the, the conversation space. And if you want a truly intelligent entity, a truly intelligent agent, there will be no such constraints, right? Because human thought is completely unbounded except for by our own limitations of imagination, creativity, and experience. But once you know about something, you can think about it and talk about it. Um, and, and the same thing uh, with preferences. Um, we, are, we are in our d normal life, we are constrained by our preferences. Um, but again, once we're exposed to a new idea, we can, we can go and ask and say, hey, can you expose me to something new? And I don't know that there's a mechanism in here that allows you to say, hey, let's talk about things differently. It's just automatically learning to talk to you the way that you understand um, or the way that you prefer. 
which means that by definition will be excluding novel things. And so you're going to end up with this some, what I predict, a somewhat useless agent um, that has a lot of boundaries in terms of what it can talk about. Um, what it what it'll just say, I'm not going to talk about that. But then also it's going to try and hone in on a very particular conversation pattern. And what's not happening is this loop. So this is this is the input processing output loop. So the input is, you know, chat comes from user, it processes, it puts out, and it goes back, right? This isn't thinking on its own. So it's not an autonomous cognitive architecture. It is a cognitive architecture, but it's not autonomous. It's, it doesn't have a detached loop where it's thinking about, okay, what is my purpose in life? And what does this user actually need? What does this user actually want? And so this is, um, this is good work. Um, it's less sophisticated than my original uh, work, Natural Language Cognitive Architecture, but it is a step in the right direction. And another advantage is that it is, um, it, it's, it's nicely documented. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, I think that's about all for today. Um, yeah, I will say to DeepMind, keep up the good work and lean into this, particularly the building a moral framework. Um, you have some work to do. Um, you need to work towards building a universal moral framework and something that is flexible and adaptable over time. You should read my book, Benevolent by Design and Symphony of Thought. Um, I talk about creating uh, moral frameworks that can be that can that can be implemented and can be flexible over time, and all the reasoning and underpinning logic behind that. So you're moving in the right direction. I approve. Thanks for watching, and uh, like and subscribe, and uh, consider supporting me on Patreon. Have a good one.